Tonight, I want to be, I want to discuss three of the biggest signs of 2015. I want to do a bit of a prophetic message. I love prophecy stuff. (laughs) This is like, I get so passionate. This is my favorite subject in all of the Bible. Uh, obviously aside from the life of Jesus and the cross and his resurrection. But this topic is something I believe in whenever we discuss what went on in 2015, that I think you will see that we are living in the end of the age. Now, I want to say this before we get started. I don't believe that everything's a spirit. I don't believe in the spirit of traffic. I don't believe that a spirit is on the McDonald's ice cream machine that's never working in McDonald's. <laughs> but I do want to discuss some things that I, be- I believe that you will find very interesting looking at 2015. And I want to say this because it affects every community, it affects the world, and it affects the church. So I want to read to you, and we're going to be coming out of this Context of Scripture, Matthew 24, verses 3 through 13. And I do have a lot to say, but I'll kind of monitor you. If, if I see you dozing off or not really liking it, I'll just wrap it up. How about that? Okay. Matthew 24, 3 through 13. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when these things shall be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. Many will be offended. Do we see offense? Okay, I just wanted to know if we watch the same news programs. And shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endures unto the end shall be saved. The three things that I want to discuss tonight have always been here. But I feel that there has been a spirit released on this nation of these three things. Number one, there is a spirit of deception. That will be rampant. Matthew 24, 4. Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. Matthew 24, 11. Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. So when we look at deception, I want to look at it from a different aspect because many of this you've already seen. False prophets shall arise. Everybody remember David Koresh? Okay, he said he was Jesus, right? That wouldn't have fooled me because I'm like, Jesus, why do you need glasses? <laughs> then there's a guy in Miami who claims to be Jesus. Then he changed and now he's the Antichrist. <laughs> That's right. But here's the thing when it comes to deception. What I see is deception of who we are in Christ. The reason I say that is because all the time at altar calls, I see the same thing. At LPCC, when we have altar calls, I see the same thing. People don't realize who they are in Christ. And when they do that, when they don't understand that, they bury their head in the sand on issues. And then another thing that I see is the weariness that people are facing due to the battles that they're engaging in 
on a daily life and living. Like you get so beat down that you cannot even enter in to God's presence. You got to pull yourself out of, out of bed to come to church because you're so beat down. So deception comes in and you just feel exhausted. You, somebody says something, you know, there's still a world going to hell. And we're still around people that don't believe in Jesus. And when we get so wrapped up in the things that we do, our problems, it causes us to put blinders on, to just look at our problem, look at our circumstance. Meanwhile, God is bringing this person to you, bringing that person to you, and you don't even deal with it because you're so weary and deceived because Satan says your circumstances will not change. Now, deception is expected in the world. The world is clueless. It always has been clueless. It is. It, it, I've never seen so much animosity towards good. Daniel says in the last days there would be a knowledge explosion, that men would travel to and fro. We see that. You can have lunch in, in one part of the world and supper in another. Then Paul would tell Timothy, in the last days there would be a generation that is always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning. So smart. So smart. Now listen, I don't even want to get into the political realm. Okay? But you could see deception in politics. Just when I said that, things popped up in your mind, so I, I trust the Holy Spirit has already revealed things to you. I don't want to get political. Okay, but I do want to give you some examples. If you notice, the demonic realm is so strong nowadays and it is celebrated. It is celebrated not only by the world, but by the church. Some people just need to stay off Facebook. <laughs> people need to realize that people see what you put. I'm not saying you, I'm not saying I know anything, so let, hear me out. But I see so many things that people post, and it's the exact opposite of what God believes, what He says. That's deception. It's worldly philosophies. So we see fear coming through in the entertainment realm. Man, sometimes I'm watching TV and I'll doze off. You know what used to freak me out? The Zales commercial. When I was a kid, like the music would freak me out, so I'd wake up to that and I'd take it off. Nowadays, I'm waking up to things crawling on the back of the, you know what I'm talking about, that demonic stuff? And I wake up and I'm like, <gasps> but people invite that and they wonder why the spirit of fear is ruling them. Then in the political realm, there's obviously fear there. We don't know who to vote for. We, we see everything coming down the line, politically speaking, and it causes fear. And then there's the fear of terrorism, obviously, that is rampant. But see, in the same vein that you see demonic, the, the demonic realm being celebrated, you see the kingdom of God being lambasted and lampooned and being pointed at as saying that's old and that's irrelevant and it's pointless. And it's the very lifeline to humanity. Even in the supernatural realm, there will be deception and false lights. You know, people call the church all the time and they're like, man, I'm hearing footsteps. I had a guy call me and said he had conversations with evil spirits. I mean, this stuff is real. You know, it's real. They call the church and they, and they want to talk about things. And it's like, okay, well, maybe we should go out there and, and talk and pray. And, you know, the, really engage in this because the spiritual realm is real. But at the same time, the power of God in the spiritual realm is real. God releases his, his angels to do his work, to minister to the saints. The Bible talks about demons being able to perform signs and wonders. It's, I mean, when you think about that, when you see apparitions, I'm not doubting you seeing something. When you see a statue crying, I'm not doubting you're seeing something, but it's not God. And so when we understand, but we get our focus from the word of God. 
When, you know, people that do seances and all this stuff, you're talking to evil spirits. You're not talking to papa or mama, but you're talking to familiar spirits. So that tells you the demonic realm is real, but the kingdom of God is more powerful. It is massive. And you and I are a part of the kingdom of God. I want to give you some things to think about. The Bible talks about in the last days that there would be people that would kill you and think they're doing God a service. You watch the news, you'll see that. Beheadings of Christians, the Bible talks about that. I'm saying all of that to get you to understand the Bible is alive and well. The Bible is wanting to speak to you if you will open it and read it. But we're in a time of spiritual blindness. Blind. We, we don't see what's going on. We listen to the news pundits who just get up and say whatever they want. And that's where we get our philosophy. That's where we get our news. And that's what we apply to our lives. The Bible says that Satan has the world blinded. In Corinthians, it says that. But he is setting the groundwork for a future kingdom. In 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 2, verses 7 and 9 through 12, I want to read this to you. For this lawlessness is already at work, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. And I believe that's the church, the rapture. That's just what I believe. Because the Holy Spirit uses the church, works through the church. Once, once that happens, people will still get saved during the tribulation and all that stuff. So I don't want to get all into that, but I just wanted to say that, share that with you. Then it says, and this man will come and do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. Now listen to this. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction. Listen, because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. It's the truth of the gospel and what Jesus Christ did for us that will save us. So, and, and so when, when we understand that, we can see the Bible is not silent when it comes to what's going on today. We can see that there is deception, that the Bible says lawlessness already at work. What it's doing is it's numbing down and deadening the minds of people. And the more they see, the more they become accustomed. And the more that they become accustomed, the more they will just fall for everything, hook, line, and sinker. You know, remember the story of Planned Parenthood. I don't know if that's political. I'll talk about it anyway. Planned Parenthood, about harvesting body parts and all that stuff. Remember that? There were people that were outraged, obviously, but there were some that saw nothing wrong with it because at the same time, a story about a lion broke. And regardless of how you feel about that, I mean, that's, it is what it is, but I read something that was very interesting. During that time, I, I personally saw more talk about the lion than about that. And I'm reminded of a picture that I saw, and it, it had a picture of a lion, and it had Christians that were tied to stakes from the old days and, and the Roman days. And it says, in a culture of death, people will root for the lion over the innocent. That spoke to me. Romans 1, 21 through 22, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks, but became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. See, the rejection of the truth brings about the futility in the darkness of the mind. That's why many call good evil and evil good. And in the, in the, the same category, they take Christianity and put it in a terrorist group. So that's deception. So we, we, we agree with that, uh, I hope. But listen, what's the life application? What's the life application? Bible-believing Christians, us, it's time that individually 
we take a stand in our own lives. Not buy into world philosophies, but buy into the kingdom of God. And live out a clear gospel presentation. See, people will give, you cre- give credit to your position when they give credit to your walk. When they see, man, something's different, they will listen to your position. But if they don't see a walk, a a, a walk worthy of a calling, the calling of God, they won't accept it. And then there's deception in the church. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Look at the major aspect that I see is that people don't know how saved they are. When you look at what Jesus Christ died to give us eternal life, it's like I talked about a while back, and I'll bring it up again. The devil has us tied with sin. We look at at areas of our life where we're more focused on sin in our lives than the goodness of God. Now, which means we look at our sin, we confess it, and we move on. We don't wallow in guilt. We don't roll around and say, woe is me. Because what happens is Satan takes a pacifier and he says, that's right, go roll around in that while I can continue to destroy everybody around you. And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to look at woe is me. He says, look at your struggles, look at your failures. You sit over there in the corner, shut up and wallow in that while I destroy your family. That's deception. Listen, you are a child of God. When you fall, You ask the Lord to forgive you. You get up from that point on. You don't have to crawl. You don't have to beg God to put you back in right standing. You're in the right standing with God because of what Christ has accomplished for you. So let me ask you. If you, you know, I asked this question a while back, but some of you may not be here. When you were lost, living in the world, did you, when you did a good thing, Did it change your lost position? No. You were still lost. But when you came to Christ, the bad thing you do, does that change your position in Christ? No, because if so, then how much more powerful is the sin nature over what Jesus Christ did for us? You see... When you look at what the Scripture says in Romans 5, 19, 4, as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. You see how that works? Let me say it again. Through one tree, we fell right in the garden. In another tree, which is the cross, because the Bible says it was made out of wood, through that tree, we got back our righteousness. You see, Adam was the first Adam, but the Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. He came and redeemed everything that was stolen from us. So when you walk around and say, well, I'm just not right with God. I'm not the righteousness of God. Listen, you know if you're saved. You know that you're producing fruit. You know that you're, you have a, 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 a lifestyle that is different than what you once lived. You know that you, you respond to conviction. See, people that are lost don't respond to conviction. They just don't like throwing up after a night of partying. But the Christian feels bad for the act and wants to move away from that because they've offended God. That's Christianity. So the reality is, you and I did nothing to become righteous, and Jesus did nothing to become sin. God placed sin upon Christ as the offering, and he placed our right, his righteousness upon us. So when you understand that, you will dust yourself off, not have to wallow in this long guilt, and move on and go forward. It's that simple. Now, that doesn't mean, oh, I could do whatever I want. That's not salvation. If you think that way, you have to relook at what you claim to believe. Now, I want to look at point number two. Racial and religious division. Matthew 24, 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now listen, there is a spiritual kingdom 
fighting in our midst. If you see it spiritually, it makes more sense. Okay? The problems of the world do not need to leak into the church. We're the answer for the problems in the world. We start buying into philosophies and news pundits, start reading into everything that's out there, and you let that stuff start getting on the inside of you, it will start to change your perception. The Bible says that God's kingdom is in heaven, but God's kingdom will come to earth. There's no racism in heaven. There's no division in heaven. And so that is what the church of Jesus Christ should look like. It should look like the kingdom of God. The word nation here is the word ethnos, where we get the word ethnic group. Now we see racial division across the board, and we see injustice on every side. No one is denying that. We see disunity in government. We, dis- we could see division on the move more than we've seen it in a while. And it really came to a heightened point in 2015. I I mean, when you look at that, to me, that was huge. That was a big problem. But we are the church of Jesus Christ, that we are blood-bought, blood-washed. We should not see division. We should see unity. That's what we, that's what we should see. There's no white church, black church, Hispanic church, Jewish church. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes and cleanses us. That's it. When we take communion, that's what we're saying. We're saying, I'm in unity under the blood of Jesus Christ. In heaven, there will be every tribe, tongue. It's going to be amazing. And if you don't like it here, you'll hate it in heaven. (laughs) If you think about it. Listen, when Satan comes in like a flood, we the church should be the standard that God raises up. You see, what we need to do is love our neighbor. It's that simple. The person next to you, love them. When you get home, that person, love them. When you go to work, love them. But listen, if you don't understand it spiritually, it's a, it's a satanic ploy to divide and conquer. I want to read you a verse that I absolutely love. It's in Ephesians 3, verses 18 through 21. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. I like that then you will be made complete and with all fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us. That means it starts by you and I understanding the love of God. That should be our lifelong pursuit. So this is how it works. You're receiving the love of God in your quiet time. You're receiving it, and you're giving it. You're understanding it, and then when you come to church, it's pouring out of you. You're loving people. You're receiving. Because listen, the love of God is where all the power comes from. When Jesus, like Pastor Todd said, was moved with compassion, you saw miracles. But look at the outcome. It says, to accomplish infinitely more than we can think or ask. Glory to him in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. That's how you change this thing going forward. You get the revelation of it. You experience it. You pour it out on everybody else and you teach it to your next generations. That's how it works. You experience the love of God. Do you know the love of God? Listen, the love of God will pour on the most hard-hearted person and begin to break that hard heart into powder. Now listen, the church is wired for victory. The DNA is victory. It's us not tapping in to the supply. We would see more if we loved more. 
But then he says the kingdom against kingdom. Now, the Greek word for kingdom is basilica, where we get, the, where we get religion. So it says there will be a religious war. There's a racial war, a religious war. What, we, what, we, what you're seeing is world try, trying to have world domination on religion. It's a showdown on whose God is supreme. We see, we see the atheist whose God is self. They spend all of their time hating a God they don't believe in. It's true. They they don't believe in him, but boy, they'll take you to task on God. But then you have, you have, you know, like Islam. And and they're at war with Christianity. They're they're at war with Judaism. Because what you're seeing is a spiritual kingdom fighting against each other, trying to take supremacy over a land. That's why when you see it on the news, you see all the, the stuff going on. The battle is for Jerusalem. What you're seeing is an eighth kingdom that the Bible talks about in Daniel and J- that John spoke about in Revelation that will come to power, power. But let me give you the end of the story. The Bible says that there is a kingdom not made with hands, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, that will come down and destroy that kingdom and grind it to a face powder. And he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. And you and I will have the privilege to serve in that kingdom. That's what's in your future. And it will be a perfect time. It will be a perfect time and a perfect reign. The Bible says in Zechariah 12, 3, it will come about in that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples and all who lift it will be severely injured and all the nations of the world will be gathered against it. I said that to say, do you not see that in the news today? That's telling you the Bible is true. The Bible is alive. You know, when you think about when Jesus is telling, telling them what will happen in 70 AD, Israel and Jerusalem got taken over by the Romans. So for about 1900 years, you see the Byzantines, the, the Ottoman Empire and the British take over all the way from then until 1947. And now you see the Jewish people coming in, ruling and reigning from their own land, their own land. That's a prophetic picture of what Jesus said would happen. When you read all throughout the Bible, you see Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of the world in God's eyes. You know, when I was in Israel, the Jewish people would say, you know, if you could peel back the sky, you would see God's feet. And he uses Israel as his footstool. There is a spy in the sky, and he sees everything that is going on. And listen, no matter what the news tells you, Jerusalem will be free, and it will be ruled by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's the end of the story. So I want you to understand that. When you see all of this stuff, don't let your heart be overcome with fear. All you have to do is say, God is doing something. The Bible talks about the king of the north coming to power. Don't you see? That's Russia. You see Russia in the news. They look like they're holding all the cards. So don't be disturbed when you see all of these things. Can I encourage you with that? We're living in the best time ever. We are living in the greatest time that prophets long to see. You and I get to see that. You and I get to operate in that. We are part of those that are bringing in the the final harvest. So let's get out of deception and move forward. That's why he says in Luke... When you begin to see all these things, look up, for your redemption is drawing nigh. Then we see religious persecution. We've already, we already see that. And that comes, you see, the church used to be a safe haven for, for, for the country. People needed rest and escape from everything. They would come to the church. But because the church is not taking sides with the way the world's going, we are now deemed the enemies. But as we love, extend the love of God, listen, I'm not saying we go along to get along, but I'm saying in the process of this, we must extend love. Listen, we can't help people out of situations if they don't know that we love them. 
If they think we're just trying to preach at them, beat them up over the head, you're not going to win anyone. You know why I think we struggle to see the gifts operate? It's because love, the love of God. I'm not talking about our worldly love that we could conjure up. I'm talking about the love of God. That harnesses the power. You see, as the world gets darker, the church needs to get brighter. We need to show that we have the answer. His name is Jesus. We do have the answer. The devastations that you face in your life is the platform that God wants to use to pick people up out of those pits that they themselves are in. The things that you've gone through in your past, God wants to use that to bring people out of their problems. And you know what causes that? That compassion will begin to rise up because you say, I see where you at, that where you are. That's where I was. But God delivered me and he wants to deliver you. You see, as the, as the cement gets harder in the world, we need to be that water that is constantly flooding, flooding that so it does not harden. We, and it might be done with tears, our own tears, but we need to be compassionate because when compassion shows up, miracles happen. When miracles happen, people pay attention and they run to the Savior. The Bible says that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. That's where we are. It says, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. And it says, yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things. Listen to this. In order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. The key word is in order. We're seeing all of this stuff. You know what's happening? We can't put our faith in this. We can't put our faith in that. We can't put our faith in politics, in finances, in health. We not, we, everything is, is, is sinking sand. But look at what it says. In order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Listen. What you are seeing is a purging. There's a dividing line. And we need to decide where we are. I encourage you. To take time and look at yourself. I do this all the time and say, Lord, where am I? Am I a sheep or am I a goat? Where is my faith and trust? Am I a wheat or am I a tear? Am I serving you because everything is going good? Because when things go bad, that's when you see what's going on the inside of you. God already knows. So those things that are shaken should push you or pull you to Christ. And number three, offense. Offense will be huge in the last days. Matthew 24, 10 and 13. And many shall be offended. And they shall betray one another. And shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endures to the end will be saved. I want to close out with this one point. One of the biggest signs that you know that you're living in the end of the age is the spirit of offense has been released. That has to be what it is. Many, When it says many, it means most. Many shall be offended. Now look at the context. It uses the word love. The love of many shall wax cold. That word is agape. It's the love that God gives. God doesn't give the world his love and, 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 and to, to function in. Agape love is unconditional, supernatural love that can only be given by God himself as it is shed abroad in your own heart. And with that love, you are able to love someone else. So if that love grows cold, what does the selfish, worldly love look like? This is talking about in the context of believers. For the love of of believers shall wax cold. Think about that. What what is the word offense? It's the word scandalon. You know what that is? You ever seen a mouse trap? That little trigger? That's the scandalon. 
Offense is a trigger or a trap that is used to entrap you and to separate you. Now, I'm about to get serious here. I'm serious because this is one of those things that will destroy you. Offense. As we talk about life groups, this is a small area to get involved in. Listen, the more time you spend time with people, the easier it is to get offended. That's just the bottom line. You get offended in marriage, family. You get Christians together. Sometimes you'll have offense. But the issue is how you handle offense. Because I want to tell you, it's very, very important. Offense can derail you. It can derail you. Now listen, when you get trapped in an offense, people will walk away from church. They blame God for people. They say, well, God, I said it. I said that before. Well, God, if all these people going to heaven, hell ain't going to be that bad. Because I was dealing with offense. And it wanted to sideline me and keep me out of church. Remember, everything that we're talking about is Satan's tactic to divide and conquer. It's like I said a while back. I believe that some of the greatest experiences that you will ever have in your church life will happen in small groups. I believe you will see miracles. I believe you will see healings because as you come together and you begin to hear each other's story and compassion rises up and you will have a desire and a burden to see problems lifted off of each other. That will be the context in which God will move miraculously. That's why it's so important you don't let a fence come in and build a fence. Psalms 133, behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down to the edge of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands the blessing. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel. So when it would have snow caps or it would, be, it would rain, it was so high, when the sun would come out, and begin to melt all of that, it would flow down Mount Hermon and literally heal the land of Israel. That's a picture of what unity does. When you come together in unity, in small group, in a church setting, and you begin to know each other, you begin to carry each other's burdens, you begin to pray with each other, that's when God commands His blessing. What is your blessing that is tied up in unity? You will never know that if you get offended and sit outside and fold your arms and say, well, I ain't going to all that. That's how you get hard-hearted. And I'm telling you, you look at people and you blame God. Well, God, why are you allowing this? And God's saying, I'm dealing with that. I need you to calm down and check yourself. I will handle what I need to handle. And I'm saying that from experience. Listen, when I came here, I was beat up, I was frustrated and aggravated, and I said this before and I'll say it again. Brother Francis said that this is a hospital for the hurting, and I'm telling you, that is 100% accurate. Amen. Praise God. I always fight with demonic microphones. You see, we should be sitting shoulder to shoulder, looking up for our marching orders, instead of looking side by side and writing down each other's offense. Look what it says in Proverbs 18, 19. An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. Come on. That's what offense does. It locks you in. And you think you got the upper hand, but really, you're missing out. Listen, many people get offended and stop going to church. They say there's nothing but hypocrites at that church, right? How many times you've heard that, maybe even said it? I promise you, if you go to Texas Roadhouse after this service, you will come across a hypocrite, but yet you will still go. You go to Walmart, you go to Chevron, put gas, you're running into hypocrites all the time. And we ourselves can be hypocritical. 
if we don't, if we don't check our own selves, you will see people that you come to church with being a hypocrite. It's true. You know how difficult it is? Become a Christian, right? I, I used to say that, oh, man, they're hypocrites. Then I became a Christian. I was like, oh, that's what that is. <laughs> it's trying to live your life for God and not fall in front of people. It, you're not a hypocrite. You're just struggling. You're a hypocrite if you castigate somebody else for the same thing you're doing. But, when, see, that's the beauty of a, of a struggle. It gives you compassion for the next guy or woman next to you. But listen, it's a scandal on, a trap to trigger, to isolate you, to set you aside, and, and, and not allow you to experience the, the things of God. But listen to this. Let me just throw this out there. Because when you look at offense, and somebody begins to share that offense, what normally happens? You got that friend that's like, girl, they did that to you. <laughs> oh, that ain't right. And then what happens is you pick up that offense and fight it harder than that person. So now you're wearing different armor and you fight in a battle and then they go ahead and make it right. Now you the one mad and you wasn't even involved. <laughs> right? You see this anytime you, you're dealing with your friend that's a guy and your, your friend that's a girl. They get in a relationship. You start taking his side like, yeah, man, you need to leave that girl alone. Or, man, you need to leave that guy alone. And next thing you know, you, done, you, know, you, you, you tried to help him. You tried to pull him out of that demonic relationship. Next thing you know, they get together and talk about how you was this and you was that. Now you the enemy. Huh, right? Well, that's an amen in there. <laughs> like been there. Now, I want to close with this. I want you to see something in the scriptures that really changed my entire perspective on offense. It's in Matthew 18, 18. We always quote this verse. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And we like, that's right. Amen. Praise God. Let me quote that scripture. But read before it. Matthew 18, 15 through 17, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you. Go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision... Treat the person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Now, if you work for H&R Block, that's not, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> I brought this out because look at the priority Jesus puts in making it right. So if you want to be able to bind and loose, like the power of God and all that, guess what? Before that, you can't have offense. If you're binding and loosing each other or binding each other, you can't bind and loose. Now finish the verse. Matthew 18, 18 through 20. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Right? We read that. Now listen, I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am among them. So you see how binding and loosing is in the context of getting rid of offense. So notice how important it is to resolve an offense. And let me tell you why it's important. The bottom line is it's never okay to stay in offense. But it's one of the easiest sins to coddle and to nurture. Oh, Shabba Bay. I can't believe they did that to me. And Satan's like, oh, man, you right, man. You, you should be mad, man. Why don't you go tell somebody? Get them on your side. That's what happens. You coddle it. I deserve to feel this way. I deserve to feel this way. But what, you know, the Bible says in Psalm 66, 18, it's a verse that I always keep close to me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So here's the issue. Do you value your need 
or the need of someone else more than out of fence. If you're praying for someone to be healed, do you value their healing more than offense? That's where the rubber meets the road. Because if, if, if we are offended with someone and God's saying, make it right, and we have a child out there that's, that's living in the world and we're pr- praying for protection and all this stuff, what if that offense in heaven is tied up in litigation and Satan is saying, They're offended. I don't have to let anything go. Do you understand? When you think about it in that context, let offense go. What is tied up? And like if I'm praying, you know, I always think about this. I mean, Dylan, my mom, my dad, I'm always trying to make sure that I don't have anything against someone because I don't want those prayers hindered. But more than that, you know how you can stay clear of offense? Realize that we offend God daily. And we expect forgiveness. See, we rebuke the devil all day. You do, do this all the time. You, Lord, hey, can somebody come out here and pray for my house, do a house cleansing? It's like, yeah, we can go. We pray and all this and that. And we, you see stuff that belongs to the devil. And we bind it and rebuke it. And the Satan's like, all right, I'm going to be back. I'm going to Burger King. As soon as you leave, I'm coming back because this is my stuff. So that's what I want you to understand. (laughs) Now, the Bible says, and I'm done after this, I promise. Matthew 18, 6, 7. But whoso, whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believes in me, it'd be better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck and were drowned into the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man whom the offense cometh. Now, when you look at the context, Jesus is not talking about the little kids. He's saying, if you want to believe in me, you come as a little child. So it's talking about offending other Christians. Now, what happens, the reason when you think about offense, when you get offended, you tend to lash out on that. Or or you receive, like if somebody's offended, they come at you. You know, they chop you down. And the Bible says that hate is as the sin of murder. So literally, when you get offended and you start offending others, you become a serial killer with your tongue. Murdering them, murdering their character. And the reason Jesus said a millstone, because in the Roman days and in the Greek culture, tying a millstone around your neck and being drowned into the depths of the sea was reserved for serial killers. So if you get offended, you let that get in your heart, you're going to start being critical. You're going to start assassinating. Everything that comes your way, you're just going to chop them to shreds. But the thing that will keep you out of that is what I just talked about, but also knowing that we've offended God. Listen, as we stand. The one thing that we need to remember is if you're offended with someone or someone offends you, it's so easy to stay in that. It's so easy to embrace that because self gets involved. But when you really look at things through the eyes of the cross and you see that my offense did that. And not only that, daily I fall, I mess up. I deal with offense. I offend the Lord when I don't live rightly. And I'm expecting forgiveness. That is the fuel that will give you the ability to lay those offenses down. Don't you get just tired of saying something, spouting off, those of you that are married, and you got to go back and I'm sorry. And they're like, well, don't do that again. I know, but you want that grace, right? You want that, you don't want to offend somebody. You don't want, because you have the heart of God. But the flesh gets in the way and you, wow. How many times do we do that with the Lord? So I want to encourage you. There's too many things going on in the world to get sidetracked on deception, on on racism, division, and offense. These are three things that we've seen in 2015, but listen, we're in 2016. 
So if you have dealt with those things, leave it there. Move forward into the things that God has for you. Maybe you didn't see God move in your life in 2015 at all. Say, well, Lord, is there anything there? Because listen, God will not break his word. Listen, when you don't see something happening with the Lord, it's not God. God's not up there like, I just don't like you today. God's like, I'm telling you, he's dealing with you. That thing that comes to your mind, we don't even want to go to pray to God. Be like, I know you're going to point out this thing that I'm dealing with. And God's like, that's right. I will point it out every single time because I have so much more if you would just let that thing go. And then when you let it go, God, it's like it unstops the drain. And you walk in the provisions and the power of God, and you're like, man, what happened? And then you get involved, and you see something on the news, and you take it in, and you start to, you know, start to form your belief system. Or somebody offends you. Be quick to forgive for your sake. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you, Lord, that your word is living and active. God, I thank you that you honor your word. God, I ask, Lord, if there's any of these things that we've mentioned tonight and your people are dealing with any of these areas, God, Father, you would begin to deal and remove those issues. And God, that you would begin to change the thought processes and the emotions that go along with that. And God, I ask that Family Life Church would be a church that pours out compassion on each other. And Lord, I pray that compassion would be the mark of every person here in their families. Lord, as they take the things that they have learned tonight and they implement it in their workplace, they implement it in their family time. And Father, that generations would be changed. Father, I thank you right now for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask. Amen and amen. I know we went a little bit over, but I thank you for your time. God bless you.